Well, David, it's so nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you, Leah. And I really enjoyed Lincoln's Dilemma. I was fascinated watching it last night. I just, I felt like I learned so much about this man that I already thought I knew to a certain extent. And I know very little. <laughs> well, I think what Lincoln's Dilemma does, and like my book, uh, Abe, on which it's based, is puts him in his time and his culture and shows his collaboration with so many other people, including African, especially African Americans. And that whole perspective on him is generally not known uh, as, as, as much as, let's say, Lincoln the politician or something. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you've written extensively about Abraham Lincoln and his life and his politics. So talk about what initially fascinated you about him and why you decided to explore his life. Yeah, I uh, was an American studies uh, major in college and I went out to graduate school in American studies and now I teach that. And I wrote books about Lincoln's era, people like Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson and Edgar Allan Poe. But I realized that I became more and more fascinated by Lincoln because a lot of these other people like uh, Whitman and Melville and so forth were writing about him. And then I realized that Lincoln was really the central figure. And the difference between Lincoln and all the others is that he had to run for office and he had to manage a, na a nation at the time. He had to be elected and then become president of a nation at the time at its most divided time in American history. And I realized that there, was, there were qualities in him that I really wanted to probe. And what I really probe is how he responded so sympathetically to his entire culture. He could quote Shakespeare by the page, even though he had less than one year of school, like primary school, you know, teenager and so forth. And he also liked body jokes all the way from the, the high to the low. And he liked sappy songs. and he. He was so curious about uh, the world around him and also so, so receptive uh, to people around him, which I think uh, Lincoln's dilemma uh, shows. Uh, people like Frederick Douglass and uh, a lot of the other African-Americans who are uh, shown in, in the film. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, Lincoln's Dilemma is based on your book, your best-selling book. So what does it mean to you to see your work on the big screen? Uh, like any film, it is based just on part of my book because I uh, discuss all of this, his closeness to African-American collaboration as part of a larger picture of everything from Lincoln and religion to Lincoln and what he loved to read and the way he liked to go to the theater. But it's great to see at least uh, one Im very important part of my book represented on the screen. And, when Richard Plepler um, left uh, HBO, he was the head of HBO to go to Apple. Uh, mine was really the first book he took on because he, he had done Game of Thrones and, and, and all, all of that, but he wanted to do something really fresh and new about Lincoln. He'd always wanted to do that. He heard I had written a manuscript. This was before the book, my book was published. And I sent him the manuscript. He, he loved it. Uh, he passed it on to the, the producers, uh, the Kunharts. They loved it. And it just went on from there. We signed up and uh, it's, it took about a year and a half or two years to make it. I worked with the producers and uh, it was such a joy uh, for me. And people who spent a long time uh, thinking about Lincoln come out quite optimistic. And I, I was just so very happy that it finally made it to the screen. And we'll be watched by, I don't know how many people, but I think a lot of people. And for me, it's important to, today because we live in such a sharply divided time to see how someone dealt with a, a time that was even more divided uh, than our own time because the North and the South went to war against each other and 800,000 Americans died uh, killing each other. But Lincoln, knew how to use his tact, his compassion, and his firmness of principle to guide America through that fiery trial. And I think it's uh, inspiring for us to watch the, this kind of film. Well, what can we learn um, from the way Lincoln did handle all of these really difficult issues as, as an average person? How can we apply that in our own lives to the way that we handle a very divided culture around us? 
Lincoln happened to be much more religious than, than uh, most people think. He, he loved to read the Bible. He knew that God was, uh, he felt that God was always in control. He put under God on American coins for the first time. And uh, he put under God in the emancipation, uh, he referenced to God in the Emancipation Proclamation. Even though he never really joined a church, uh, he would pray. And uh, in the second inaugural address, he says that, you know, God is against slavery. He's, but at the same time, at the same time, Lincoln was very compassionate toward other people. He was a great believer in the golden rule, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And he never demonized the enemy. He never said bad things about the South, about Southerners. And he said, you know, they pray as well to the Bible and to God, and we pray. Uh, we feel that we're on the side of justice. We, we feel that, that the Bible is against slavery. But he, he reached out emotionally to his, his uh, uh, so-called enemy, enemy, never called them uh, the enemy whatsoever. But he also believed in the firmness of principle and also the union, the, uh, the idea of one common country. When Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, came to him and said, can we make peace between the two countries? Because uh, Davis uh, felt that he had a different country. He said, Lincoln said, I, I, I will happily make peace as one common country, but one common country without slavery. You know, so uh, he, he didn't turn off Davis. He just said, yeah, we, as, as one common country. So um, all of those things together and the fact that he had a real folksy persona, Abe, Honest Abe, Uncle Abe, Old Abe. Uh, he didn't even like the Abe nickname, but he knew that without that persona, without the common man, um, um, uh, you know, image, the people wouldn't love him as much as they did. And he really projected the image of, of old Abe. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that part was so interesting. And in the beginning of, of the series, it suggested that there's too much hyperbole when we talk about Lincoln in general. Either we sort of make him a, a villain or a hero. So can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. It's, it's easy to make him a hero because, well, he was assassinated tragically just after the Civil War was in. He became a kind of saint and there was a lot of hagiography and isn't he great? And maybe a little too much of that. And even to this day, that kind of uh, uh, glow. Also something else that happens as well is that you tend to isolate him and put him on a pedestal. And he was the, the white savior who came along. He would be the first to say, no, 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 no. I, you know, it, the, this was a group effort here. This was a group effort. Uh, how much respect I have uh, for African-Americans who helped me. People like Frederick Douglass, the 180,000 African-American soldiers. Uh, he would be the very, very first to, to say that, not, not the last. So, so he wouldn't like being put up on, on, on a pedestal. And then our, there are other people who neglect his compassion and his closeness to African-Americans. And, and they cherry pick certain moments where he sounds conservative. And my answer to that is that he had to get elected to office. He had to win the votes of all kinds of voters. A lot of them were very conservative and so forth. And it, sometimes he had to be on it. He was on, he compared himself to a tightrope walker, Charles Blondin, who went back and forth across Niagara Falls, no net, forward, backwards, pushing a wheelbarrow. And he said, you know, I'm Charles Blondin. Sometimes I have to learn, lean to the right. Sometimes I have to lean to the left. If I don't, the, the country could collapse we could lose the border states. There were five states that had slavery, but they were still loyal to the union. And he said, if, if we lose, if I do say the wrong thing at this time, we're gonna lose Kentucky or Missouri. We're gonna lose, uh, we might as well surrender Washington right now. Uh, and he said, I, I just have to be blonde. And so I think, I think the film conveys that as well. His sense of political tact, uh, I think comes through uh, very well. And the series is so interesting because it highlights some of the slave narratives um, and, and sheds light on the Black experience during the Civil War. Some of these stories are just heartbreaking. They're horrific and they're eye-opening. Um, talk about why it was so important to share these stories when discussing Lincoln, when telling his story. 
Lincoln saw, as many uh, abolitionists saw of his time, that enslaved people were not things. They were not property. They were human beings um, that loved, that had grief, that had joy. They were human beings. They were not property. And the importance of a film like this is to show not just Lincoln, but also the fact, the experience of being enslaved and the experience of fighting for your freedom as an African-American uh, soldier uh, in the war. It gets down to ground level and real human emotion uh, on the part of people who back then were considered just things or inferior beings. And it's very, very important for a film like as this film does to get into that emotional experience. Uh, and I, I think it does it very, very powerfully. It does, it absolutely does. Now, much has been written about Abraham Lincoln over the years. Um, there's so many books out about him, but but yours has made waves. It's it's a bestseller. It's now it's 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 based, you know, a series is based on your book. Why do you think your take on Lincoln, your research on Lincoln is resonating with so many people? Well, it's funny because I don't really discuss modern times in my book, uh, the 20, you know, 21st century or anything like that. But when I was writing the book, I realized that almost every page, a reader could make a leap to modern times. and would almost automatically uh, make, a, make a leap. Not that I was trying to force the issue, but it so happened that he lived in a very, very divided time. It was divided over issues that we, we deal with today, issues of race, uh, issues of, of religion, evangelical religion and so forth, and issues of, let's say, the right versus the left and all of that. It was all kind of there. And also, I try to bring uh, Lincoln alive as a human being uh, in a way that I think other people have not. He loved to recite poetry and his greatest speeches are really prose poems. The, the Gettysburg Address is only 272 words. It's, it's very short and yet it's by far the greatest speech because it's so pithy and concentrates so much meaning about America in such rhythmic, beautiful poetic language uh, that really appeals to everyone. And so that's the kind of side of Lincoln that I think my, my book resonates with people. Uh, the human side and his engagement really with humanity in the broadest sense of the word. Absolutely. So David, what is your hope for Lincoln's Dilemma? What do you want audiences to take away from the series? I hope that they come out with a sense of a leader being capable of openness to various voices, the voices of various ethnicities, various religious points of view, and a leader who is um, truly human and, as he said, malice toward non charity to all, even refusing to demonize your enemy. He never demonized the Confederacy or the South or anything like that. And yet, a leader who sticks to to principle, the principle of justice and equal rights, equal rights uh, for everybody. So I, I, I hope they come across with that, that message. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me. I really enjoyed it.